Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to All Saints. Wonderful to have you here and wonderful to have those uh, watching online who, uh, for various reasons, can't be with us uh, physically, but very much with us uh, watching online and participating spiritually with us uh, throughout this service. Welcome to you. Today we're thinking about gospel partnership. Whatever thoughts come into your mind with the state of the world, affairs uh, globally and locally, we know that uh, the gospel is the hope of the world. And the Apostle Paul uh, was unashamed about the gospel because it is good news that reconciles God with people and people with each other. He says in the book of Romans... I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And later on in the uh, book of Philippians, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. We are a gospel church, a good news church, and we're in partnership with other churches who preach the gospel and live the gospel because God has brought us into relationship with him. He is our creator and our redeemer. We're going to stand and praise him. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice. Praise our creator and our redeemer for this wonderful gospel partnership he's won for us.
in that spirit of worship, please be seated as we come before Almighty God, still praising Him with the following prayers. We come before Almighty God and say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we come before Almighty God in a humble attitude to confess that we need his grace. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your son, Jesus. Father, forgive us. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just before the children go out, I have a a couple of notices. Uh, On Wednesday, our Life of Jesus course starts in the hall at 7.30. Please do come along to that. Come try it out for the first week. Come back again if you like it. Uh, We'll be going through Luke's Gospel and looking at some historical evidence. It's a well-written course, uh, very uh, well put together videos and good discussions and nice tea and cake as well. What could more could you want on a Wednesday evening in Eastbourne? Do come along to that. I need to publish uh, some bands of marriage. So I published the bands of marriage between Edgar's Cownans of this parish and on the electoral roll of All Saints and Georgia Taylor also of this parish. This is for the second time of asking if anyone knows a reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Great. Let's pray for them again and then we'll pray for the children as they go out to their groups. Heavenly Father, we do pray for Ed and Georgia as they prepare for their wedding day. Prepare them in heart, mind and spirit for a lifelong marriage looking to Jesus the author and perfecter of their faith, that they may serve you and each other in a lifelong union that shows the beauty of Christ and the church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray for the children going to their groups. May they fix their eyes on Jesus. Would the word planted fall in good soil and produce a harvest of righteousness in your perfect timing? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the children go out to their groups with their leaders, just say hello to the person next to you, and then we're going to meet um, John from the Sussex Gospel Partnership. We'll do carry those conversations on over tea and coffee after the service. Uh, But we're going to meet one uh, new person, maybe to many of us. Maybe some of you have met John before. Uh, I'm going to invite John Hobbs up. 
Uh, John, wonderful to have you with us. John, can you tell us a little bit about um, yourself uh, and your role in the SGP, the Sussex Gospel Partnership? Sure. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, nice to meet you if I haven't met you before. I live in Haywards Heath, married to Beth, and if you've ever been to Wakehurst Place, she works there, she does all their uh, kind of exhibitions and stuff. I've got three kids, Esme is almost 20, Ruben's 16, Felia 14, two introverts, and an extrovert 14-year-old. Um, and I am the minister of Grace Church in Haywards Heath, but two days a week, I work as the trainer for the Sussex Gospel Partnership, a uh, partnership of 70-plus ministers and churches throughout Sussex that partner together to uh, raise up leaders, to plant churches, and to further the gospel. And you guys are part of that, which is great. And um, do you recognize some faces that have been I on do. that um, training, training course yeah. already? So thank you for your smiles. Um, but it's nice to meet new people as well, uh, actually, in being here. Yeah. Just for those of us, who, John, who are not familiar with the SGP, the Sussex Gospel Partnership, and the training courses particularly, how long has it been going, and how many people has, um, have been trained over yeah, Sussex? thank you. So the Gospel Partnership's been going for about 20 years, uh, and the training course actually started in Eastbourne pretty soon on, uh, it's now based in Haywards Heath. And we reckon about 1,400, 1,400 or so students over the years have gone through these courses, which is really exciting. And people think training course, well, that's for all the sort of super Christians. Yeah. But actually, the wonderful thing about these courses is that they're not at all. So sometimes we have people that have only been Christians a few months. We have people, sometimes six formers, uh, or those on a year out before uni. Uh, and then we have people who have been retired for quite a long time who come. So we've got people all across that come on these courses. Um, and uh, basically, we run a Tuesday course in Cookville, which is sort of Hayward Seath, for two years, yeah. every Tuesday from uh, 10 o'clock till 4.15. Uh, and uh, then we do a Saturday course uh, in two locations around Sussex, which is a sort of condensed version from 9.30 till 1.00. Uh, and on the courses, you, we do a whole Bible overview, which people love because all the bits start to fall into place. We look at different Christian doctrines, which are sort of key truths of the Bible. We look at how to get to grips with the Bible for ourselves. How do we help to pass it on to others, which might be formal, like you're a home group leader or something, or might be informal, that we're trying to teach our kids or our grandkids the gospel. Um, and we look at all sorts of different issues, the kind of things that we all want to think about more deeply. Right. And that Saturday course, um, uh, we've had a wonderful experience of hosting it here the past two years. We've got a couple of months left to go until the summer, until that two-year course is finished. But um, if you weren't lucky enough to sign up to that course, um, but there's the Tuesday. Where's that going to be um, so this coming year? And Tuesday, Saturday. from September, is going to be in Cookfield. So yes. you get the train up to Hayward Heath, which is very easy from Eastbourne, and uh, then we can help you get a lift up from there or you drive up. Um, and the Saturday one is going to be in Crawley. St. Andrew's Crawley. So if you think, oh, I wish I'd been on that one when it's been in Eastbourne, but I couldn't do it, do join us in Crawley. I'll be the friendly face to welcome you. Uh, we start that in September, and it's just one Saturday morning a month, so it's not burdensome, but we cover a lot of ground, and people tend to really love it. Great. And John, we, um, as an Anglican church here, we uh, uh, so appreciate, uh, appreciate the training that is going on. Um, Bishop Martin in the diocese recognizes this course and uh, fully approves of it for uh, lay uh, training and um, is very enthusiastic for many people to go through it. It's at a very good rate, good uh, course fees, and um, wonderful, clear, um, deep theology but accessible, as John has mentioned. So, so yeah. we do commend it uh, to you if you're thinking about um, just further uh, interest and uh, for your own personal study in the Scriptures and how you can serve the church family here and be a blessing to the mm. gospel going out in Sussex, as we'll hear shortly. Yeah, I mean, just to say, if you want to sign up, if you go online to the Sussex Gospel Partnership training, there'll be all the information there. It's just been renewed this week, uh, so you should be able to go to that. And because we've renewed that, we've got a whole bunch of leaflets coming hot off the press as well. So I'm sure James will get those leaflets out to you yeah. at some point uh, in the next uh, couple of months. And that will give you a little bit more. But you can do it all through the website if you're someone who uses the internet. Uh, Great. Well, thanks so much, John. We look forward to hearing you uh, shortly. We're going to sing again, then pray, have the scriptures read, and then John will preach uh, for us. So let's stand and uh, respond again uh, in song, asking for God's gospel vision for our church again. Be thou my vision. Let's stand and sing.
whatever version you were singing, the Lord <laughs> knew wonderfully. Please be seated as we come to him in prayer. Let's pray for the church, the world, and for all those that are in need today. Father, we pray for your church. Thank you that we have John with us and sharing with us this morning. We thank you for the work of the Sussex Gospel Partnership and its mission to encourage and strengthen Bible-centered churches to grow and advance the gospel. Help us not to go astray, but to remain in you. Help us not to waver and be influenced by modern trends and liberal culture. Help us by your spirit to be able to discern what is true from error and to stand on biblical truth. We pray for your church worldwide and ask that you would send revival and renew your church as the body of Christ. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters who in many countries are being persecuted and under threat because of their faith in Jesus. We ask for protection and practical support for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the world that you perfectly created and that you so love. We're sorry and ashamed that there is so much darkness, distress, confusion and pain in our world today. As your word commands us, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Behold, the one who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. Thank you that your hand is always on your people. We pray for those still being held hostage and pray for their freedom. And please bring your peace and your government to those in Gaza. And we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. Father, please intervene and soften hearts so that this senseless damage and killing stops. Graciously intervene and cause these situations not to widen and for the violence to end. Please strengthen those who today work for peace and justice throughout the world and hold back the schemes and plans of the evil one. Speak into these storms, we, we pray, and bring your peace. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. And Father, we pray particularly for Charles, our King, and Kate, and all members of the royal family at this time. Please heal and bless them with good health and strengthen their faith in you. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Let's pray for the ministry and work of all saints and our mission partners. Father, we pray for our new mission partner, Video Bible Talks, who without charge support churches with video-based Bible teaching resource. We give thanks that last year over 12,000 people around the world received their Bible teaching ministry. We pray you would help the team as they edit their new series from Genesis promises and blessings and for favour in their grant applications so that they can continue the charity's ministry and mission. And we pray for your blessing on the new course, Life of Jesus, that starts here on Wednesday evening. We pray that many will accept invitations to come and join in and that they will enjoy the fellowship and teaching and discover the truth of the gospel. We pray that by your spirit, you would use this so that many come to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And we pray for the plans for our annual parochial church meeting in a, just over a week's time. Lord, may it be a time of great joy and thanksgiving for your faithfulness and all that you have done in and through us in the last year. And strengthen our resolve as a church family to trust you for the year ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray for our family members and friends who have still yet to acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Let's have a time of quiet and lift them to the Lord.
Father, please soften their hearts and break down every wall that is preventing them from taking this step. Give them the revelation that Jesus has died for them. Please send your witnesses and draw our loved ones to yourself, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And now let's pray for our friends in the church who are unwell, for those recovering from illness and others that are on our hearts. And let again have a time of quiet as we lift them to the Lord. Father, we thank you that your hand of mercy, grace and healing is upon each one. Please bring them great comfort and peace, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with a prayer for ourselves. Father, help us to take every opportunity this week to share and tell of your great love. Cause us all to grow in our love for you and give us a heart of compassion and generosity and a willingness and commitment to care and serve others. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Bill. We're going to turn to the Scriptures now as Beth comes to read for us uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 6 to 22, that's found on page 1197. Reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesophorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus ill in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's a real joy to be with you all uh, today. Do keep that open with you uh, if you could. Uh, so we'll be working through it and learning from it. Uh, such an engaging and important part of God's Word. But let's pray for his help as we come to it. Father in heaven, we know that all your Word is inspired, that it trains us and equips us 
but above all reveals you to us. And we pray, gracious Lord, that you'd help me to be faithful and clear in unpacking this text, but for all of us, Lord, that you'd give us those humble, teachable hearts that would be formed in Christ, that we would play our part in this gospel partnership well, for his sake. Amen. So imagine if you can that you and a friend start up a cafe together. Together, you know what your purpose is. You're going to pour yourself out to see this cafe well established and perhaps some other cafes join in with it uh, as well. To establish a business together. Well, you've entered a, a special kind of fellowship, haven't you, as you do that? I was struck that the Canadian theologian Don Carson tells us that this is the idea at the heart of that phrase that James read earlier from Philippians 1 of gospel partnership. The word partnership there in the Greek is koinonia. It's the same word we often translate fellowship. And Carson writes, the heart of true fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision So Christian fellowship, this togetherness here, he writes, is about self-sacrificing conformity to the gospel. So to gospel purposes, to spreading that gospel, that good news about the Lord Jesus. And it's this gospel partnership that we might say is the family business that the Apostle Paul is urging his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy, to partner with him in as he writes this final letter of his life. If you have it in front of you, look at at chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul writes to Timothy there, Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me. What in? In suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Well, is this family business that if you've come to faith in Christ, you've been enrolled in by virtue of belonging to him, being part of his family, commissioned by Jesus the King to make disciples of all nations. That's what we're about, isn't it? And it's the same family business that the Sussex Gospel Partnership is all about, seeking to see not just uh, one fellowship of different partners in the gospel, that's you, but also different fellowships, different cafes, if you like, coming together to fulfill this great mission. Well, four encouragements for us this morning. First, verses six to eight are all about the perspective that promotes this partnership, and that perspective is glory. Here we see what drives the Apostle Paul. Have a look at verse seven. As he looks towards his own death, he can say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, the word kept there, it's not really about keeping on believing the faith. It's about keeping the faith safe. It can be translated watch over. So in Acts 12, it describes how sentries guarded or watched over the door where Peter was imprisoned. So Paul has kept the faith safe, do you see? In chapter 1.14, he urges Timothy to guard the gospel. And in chapter 2, verse 2, to do that by passing it on to reliable men who can in turn pass it on to others. It's about gospel partnership. You and I, we're, we're in a relay race, aren't we? We have this glorious treasure like the baton to pass on to others and to pass on particularly to the coming generations. And by this means, we find those enlisted in this business multiplied. It's a key reason why we run the training courses. I've done them for 12 years. And the reason I do them is because I'm so convinced that what we need above all else is not just the gospel for me, but the gospel for them. And particularly, I don't know if you feel it, but a lot of people are feeling that with the decline of Christianity in the UK, uh, they're feeling a little bit panicky about the future. Well, 
nothing is more important than not just keeping, protecting the gospel, ensuring it's not diluted or compromised, but also passing it on to the next generation so that they can do that in turn, do you see? This is what gospel partnership is all about and is what drove the Apostle Paul on. It's what caused him to be ready to pour out his life, verse 6, like a drink offering. The finish line of verse 7, verse 8, the laurel crown of the victor, that's what he's seeking. But above all, verse 8, Paul is driven by a desire for the righteous judge to vindicate him in the age to come and to vindicate him before all those who perhaps despised, laughed at his great desire to see this gospel promoted. Verse 8, if you look at it, look, speaks of believers longing for Christ's appearing, doesn't it? But actually, the word there is agape, so it's actually loving. They're, they're those who love Christ's appearing. Christians, isn't that what should drive us on in sacrificing for the gospel? We're longing, we're loving Christ's appearing. We're, we're like the bride eager to see her husband and wanting everything to be ready for when he comes back. And just think of the joy it brings Christ. If your investment in people or money or prayer led perhaps to a church plant here in Eastbourne or a revitalized church. Just think of Christ's pleasure when no one else sees but you're praying for that struggling believer in the church. Or when you stutter out the gospel at the school gate or when you sacrifice those evenings when everyone else is watching the box set but you're organising an evangelistic event for all saints or you're attending your home group even though you're shattered because you know you can encourage people there and help them to learn more of the truth. Those are the things that please the one we're longing, we're we're loving to see. If you know the books of C.S. Lewis, when Aslan returns, we want to be found a Peter, not a Eustace, in how we've ruled over Narnia, don't we? But second, in verses 9 and 10, we see the mindset that rejects this gospel partnership is one of worldliness. The NIV misses the contrast between verses 8 and 10. Verse 8 ends with those who love Christ's appearing. And verse 10, if you look at it there, begins with Demas, who loved this world. Isn't that an interesting contrast? Paul's asking Timothy and us, what are we going to love? Do we love Christ's appearing or do we love this world? Now, Demas's worldliness may have been a cowardice, in the face of persecution. It might have been a simply a desire for money and ease and luxury. We don't know, but we're reminded here, aren't we, that if we are to be gospel partners, we must first be world forsakers. If we are to be gospel partners to play our part well, we have to be first world forsakers. The older I get, the more I think I feel the pressure of loving this world. Most of my friends are more wealthy than we are. They enjoy more hobbies and holidays than we do. They seem to have more of that most valuable thing, time, <laughs> and with it, energy. And so whilst we might formally confess to being partners in the Christian family business and might speak of its infinite importance, in reality, we can so easily fail to play our part properly, can't we? And especially when we feel ostracized, left out by the world around us, got at perhaps by our culture. It can be only too easy, can't it, just to pull back, to take the foot off the accelerator rather than have this love of Christ driving us on. But friends, you know, what did Jesus call us to? He said, doesn't he, if everyone wants to be my disciple, they must take up their cross daily and follow me. To lose our lives. For him and his words, knowing that we gain them, of course, ultimately. 
And in chapter 2 of the letter, Paul makes the same point with illustrations. He uses the illustration of the soldier pleasing his commander, of the athlete getting the crown, of the hard-working farmer sharing in the harvest. With each illustration, the point is it's about hard graft now for reward to come. That's what it is to partner in the gospel, to play our, our work role well, isn't it? Gospel graft now. Righteous reward in the end. So whilst we're in this desert age, let's not be those looking back to Egypt as the Israelites did. But let's look forward to Canaan, to our promised land, and the one who will welcome us there. We pray with those words, welcome good and faithful servants. But third, we also see here the reality that requires partnership, which is our limitedness. So helpful that we get into the practicalities here. First, we see we should engage in partnership because there is a global need uh, and there's a limitedness in, in the ability to meet that need. We're limited in what we can do beyond, you know, the parish or elsewhere, but others can do it and we can partner with them in it. Just consider the scope of ministry in verses 10 and 11. Paul is in what is now Italy, Timothy's in southern Turkey, Crescens has gone into central Turkey, and Titus is in Croatia. <laughs> That's astonishing, isn't it? Just the sheer scope of these gospel partners. I do wonder whether one of the great lies that holds back gospel partnership is the assumption that we're only responsible for our church, our parish, our area, rather than go, what goes on across the county, across the nation, and across the world as well. If your cafe is part of a chain of cafes, then faithfulness to the family business is seen in ensuring that they flourish as well, isn't it? That's why the Sussex Gospel Partnership is something to really celebrate. Partnering together with others who really believe the gospel and want to see it spread. And a church like this that's perhaps more secure, more resourced, is able to help those who feel less secure, who have less resource, as you partner together. Perhaps it might be an All Saints choosing to give money to aid churches elsewhere that can't afford the ministry. Or sending some of you to be involved in a plant or a revitalization. We're facing this as a church. We've got about 60 or so adults. And uh, being involved in planting a church in the next town is going to mean particularly some of the younger, more energized adults going to be in that. That's hard. But how wonderful if that means that more souls are saved, more are strengthened. Or, or maybe it might be a new organizing events here that would benefit churches in the local area or beyond it. Whatever it is, it should at least mean that we're all praying for the work of the gospel beyond, beyond this parish, beyond Eastbourne, beyond Sussex, beyond the nation and into the world. Praying for it. And at least at some point considering whether the Lord might be calling you to get involved in overseas mission. Perhaps with full-time gospel work, perhaps in using your own vocation, but getting involved in a church somewhere else in the world. But second here we see... We should engage in partnership not just because of global need, but because of personal need as well. This is what stands out, I think, the limitedness of our own human weakness. Think about Paul's need, first of all, of company when alone. So displaying great self-sacrifice, he's happily let his friends go to serve elsewhere. So look at verse 11. It means he only has Luke with him. So verse 9, he's longing for Timothy to be there too but he doesn't just need company he also needs help verse 11 he asked timothy to bring mark who can help paul's ministry and verse 13 for timothy to bring the materials he needs and he doesn't just need help he also needs support so verse 14 he mentions how he'd been opposed by alexander and things remain difficult so verse 16 paul is on trial probably for the second time in rome and at his first offense no one came to his support everyone deserted him 
no doubt worried that to be linked to the Apostle Paul would mean that they were got out as well. Imagine how Paul must have felt. He can testify the Lord Jesus stood by him. Wonderful affirmation of the real, true presence of Christ. The Lord Jesus stood beside him, but he was clearly hurt. It is worth pondering, isn't it, that when, when James got ordained, it wasn't like um, Peter Parker getting bitten by a, an amazing spider and suddenly becoming Spider-Man, this super, um, Superman-type character able to deal himself with all the pressures of ministry and beyond. He's just a human being like the rest of us, sensitive, fragile, limited, We need other people in ministry, just as the Apostle Paul did, because, you know, ministers aren't messiahs. We're limited geographically, so we need others to go where we can't. But we're also limited by weakness. To those involved in gospel partnership, they need others just to give them company, support. It's not good for man to be alone, the Bible begins. And even Jesus in Gethsemane, remember? He needed his friends to watch and to pray with him. Loneliness, can I say, is one of the top reasons that ministers leave the ministry. And I'd like to say that it, due to the current crisis in the Church of England, faithful Anglican ministers like James and Tash, serving with him, are feeling anxiety and stress and loneliness to an unprecedented degree at the moment. So for you as gospel partners, furthering the gospel could be as much as you calling them or WhatsApping them to encourage them or someone else serving in the church, having them around for a meal rather than them always having others around. Ask them to go to the pub or out to the cinema. Just coming alongside. And beyond that, asking them what you can do to help, to help relieve the burden, to help them furthering the gospel and you playing a part alongside them in that. If the manager of your cafe was struggling, isn't that what you'd do? How can I help? What can I do to, to help you through this time? But fourth... And finally, the Christians that embrace partnership, they are those that are noteworthy. All God's word matters, even the last few verses of these letters, the sign-offs. Just look at the names of verses 19 to 22. We don't really know much about them, do we? And that's actually the point. Those involved in gospel partnership are not just the ministers like Timothy or Titus, or James. They are everyday Christians, couples like Priscilla and Aquila, who just pop up throughout the New Testament, hosting churches, teaching the faith, doing what actually I'm sure many of you do in the church, just being there, wanting to serve. And then there are individuals, just simply mentioned. I, I love in the Old Testament when, um, when you read through and you get those lists of David's mighty men. It might be a male thing, I don't know, but when I read those, I sort of straighten my back, think, I want to be a, a mighty man for the Lord. I wonder whether these are the New Testament equivalents. We just get the lists of names, names of those who are noteworthy in how they served the gospel. And so they encourage us, don't they, to think, What's my legacy going to be? Would my name have a particular mark against it in the, the book of Christ because I've poured myself out like Priscilla and Aquila or Nesiphorus or whoever it might be? If we're to really narrow it down, there's only one reason we're all still here. It's to be involved in gospel work. Making disciples. But we don't do that solo. We do that as partners together pouring ourselves out, as the Apostle Paul did and as he encouraged Timothy himself to do. Well, let's have a moment of quiet, a chance for you to pray that home for yourself, perhaps to confess sin, perhaps to ask the Lord to help you to see how you can use your own gifts in partnering 
with others for the gospel. A moment of quiet for you to pray. So, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gospel that we've already heard is your great power for the salvation of all who believe. We thank you, Lord, for the way it has saved us and continues to transform us and benefit us and those we love. Father, would you keep us from wanting to just simply hold that to ourselves, help us to embrace your calling to be partners in the gospel one with another and as a church with other churches. Help us to see how we might do that practically, that we might see the gospel multiplied and your kingdom grow. We ask it all for the sake of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Well, thank you so much, John, for taking us to the Scriptures to remind us of God's amazing grace and this wonderful gospel partnership that we do enjoy locally and with our mission partners. So let's stand in response and praise God for his amazing grace, which draws us into this wonderful gospel partnership. remain standing as we declare the gospel that we guard and we pass on to others together. Let's declare our faith in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Please do be seated as we come to the Lord's table to take the bread and the wine. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and are in good fellowship with one another, come and take the bread and the wine to your comfort as we long for his appearing. So the Lord Jesus invites you to his table of grace and mercy, longing for that day that we will feast with him for all eternity. So come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We say together, Come, Lord Jesus, come. For those of you not familiar with how we do things at All Saints, if you're visiting this morning, we have three stations at the front. Uh, if you want uh, gluten, uh, free bread, or non-alcoholic wine, come to the front here. There's a station at the back and one at the side. I'll invite the helpers to come uh, first, and then you'll be directed up.
For as God's beloved children, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As God's family here on earth, let's stand and sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for us. Let's stand and sing. that longing day in our, the forefront of our minds. Let us sit as we offer ourselves in gospel partnership this week to the Lord, maybe particularly this afternoon in the sunshine, spending some time giving thanks to God for the partnership we enjoy, for all that everyone in the church family offers of themselves freely in response to God's grace. Let's come before him and pray and offer ourselves to this wonderful invitation for gospel partnership to partner with the Lord Jesus in his everlasting kingdom. We pray together. May the giving of our time, talents, and money be a token of our desire to serve you, O God, with all that we have and all that we are. For all things come from you, O Lord, 
and of your own do we give you. Amen. Holy and everlasting God, by your power we are created, and by your love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service, and live each day in love to one another, and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you'd like prayer, come to the side chapel. Do encourage each other over tea and coffee in the church hall. Cafe Church tonight at 6.30. And the theme is blue, but the sky is blue. It's not just sadness. There's good news to be had tonight at Cafe Church at 6.30. Have a great week, everyone.